Let's Talk Native is produced at the LTN Studios on the Cataraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. We break all the rules for Native media by peeling back the layers of assimilation and indoctrination. No prayers, no buffalo speeches, and no spirituality shows. While this podcast does not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do take a tough look at history, oppression, and our survival. We highlight the voices of Native activists, writers, poets, artists, thinkers, and musicians who are fighting for the rights of Indigenous people all over Turtle Island. We may step on a few toes through our examination of culture, art, politics, history, and identity. But the real goal here is to bring our people together by breaking down what separates us. In this moment of historical change and social justice, our voices matter now more than ever before. So, welcome to Let's Talk Native with John Kane. Sego and uh, and welcome. Uh, we've got a great show for you tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk about some tough issues, uh, but I do again want to welcome you to the program. Uh, I have my uh, guest, I've got Janine Yazi joining us tonight. She uh, is back. She uh, joined us several weeks ago, uh, trying to give us an update on uh, COVID-19 in Navajo territory. And, and I'll start there. Um, so, Janine, welcome back to the, to the program. It's, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, although I'm not so excited about the topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> that's just how it goes sometimes, I guess. Um, well, first, let me, let me uh, how are you guys doing? How are you doing, first off, and, and your family? Uh, we're doing great, um, hanging in there. I, I think there's been a lot of great work, uh, shifting mutual aid efforts and work on the ground to look at more long-term systemic changes that our communities deserve while also uh, preparing for the the second wave um, that's expected with the fall. Right, and it's tough because we, we're seeing surges uh, that are really part of the first wave, uh, just because yeah. of relaxing, uh, you know, the attention that people are giving it. Uh, I know uh, one of, among the immediate things that we're seeing is, you know, the, the Sturgis motorcycle uh, rally and um, uh, and 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 the fact that there is not only a, a, um, a rash of in infections in North and South Dakota as a result of it, but all those people went home and, and brought it home as well. So, I mean, it's just an, it's emblematic of, of what's what's been happening with all of this. And uh, and I don't know is you guys have represented a. Um, you know, um, among you know, uh, the worst hot zones uh, for a non-urban, uh, you know, population center. So, are uh, how how is your community dealing with it? Uh, individual members or people, I guess, or, or the you know the Navajo people themselves. Well, we're still very much reeling from it, but it seems surreal. Like as you said, there are attempts to reopen. Uh, at some scale, a lot of uh, businesses, the tribal government is reopening in a limited capacity. Schools are starting again with the option for students to go in person or, or meet virtually. And there are people taking advantage of the in-person uh, options. So I feel like if there's a dangerous relaxation that we've seen that you've mentioned in other places that then leads to another surge. Um, and so I, I, I feel like it's a it's a quiet moment in that we have, in the sense, plateaued in terms of new cases, um, but it, it's it's a eerie quiet moment. We still have close um, nine thousand five hundred and seventy three positive cases of covid. Um, close to 500 confirmed deaths from COVID. And there's still a lot to learn from the, the first three months in terms of, you know, uh, how many um, unaccounted deaths there have been because we didn't have the testing and because of other factors that led to low numbers initially. And it's also hard to really have a lot of faith in the, in the plateau that we're seeing because it's also harder to access test sites and to get testing um, regularly. And so I'm not sure exactly how much optimism to pit in, into the, the data that shows we're, we're plateaued, but it is weird kind of operating in the midst of, of surrounding counties and activities that are 
sort of trying to return to normal. Right. Yeah, I get that. And and I, and I think when we you look at some of the the numbers that are being put out there nationally, uh, they they are tied to almost a relaxing of the 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 uh, the, the testing. And so even as the the number of confirmed cases don't seem to be rising um, or, or even dropping, the number of deaths aren't. So, you know, so when mm -hmm. you hear somebody like Donald Trump saying, well, the reason we have such high numbers is because we test so frequently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, those are just about, you know, certifying a case of, uh, of COVID-19. The fact is when somebody dies and they can determine that that person died of COVID-19, it doesn't matter if they were tested or not. They still had it. And, you know, so it, it, you're right. The, the numbers become very, very difficult to, um, I don't know, to, 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 to have, re, you know, uh, uh, confidence in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Well, um, and again, I think we where we live, um, we're the territory is seems to be doing OK. Um, but we're actually seeing in all of New York State, the western area of New York State, where Seneca Territory is located, is probably has the um, the most uh, um an increase in, in active cases. So uh, we're going to have to wait mm -hmm. and see how that goes, especially with things like schools reopening and stuff like that. We're, we're going to learn where this, where this leaves us. So, all right, let me move on to the tough subject. <laughs> I mean, I, I desperately reached out to you today because I'm, I'm thinking, will somebody please try to put either a counter narrative or some explanation on how it is that Navajo leadership so often and, and not just the current leadership, but so often Navajo leadership seems to take on a position that is that is the opposite of what most, especially grassroots Native people feel, whether it's the, the mascot issue. I mean, you, you're, you're the current president of the Navajo Nation, um, while took the opportunity to praise the Washington football team uh, dropping the R word, decided to offer code talkers as a suggestion. Not, completely missing the mm -hmm. whole point that the that the mascot issue using native people for mascots is a problem for most of us but um mm -hmm. so they don't seem to get that i mean you, you go back and you got ben shelley you know sitting with dan snyder at football games wearing a washington redskins jacket peter mcdonald's another former president doing i mean it's like so the mascot issue they, they seem to be on the wrong side of now you got this Navajos for Trump movement. And in fact, the vice president of the Navajo nation, uh, Myron, um, uh, what the hell is his name? Uh, Lizer, um, Lizer, Lizer, I don't know. Lizer, yeah. Lizer. Um, he may be speaking as we speak. I don't know. He's supposed to be speaking at the, at the RNC, the Republican national, uh, uh committee's uh, convention today. Um, and doing so in the midst of <laughs> even even the RNC uh, um, taking a you know a strong position being pro Columbus Day, I mean, which puts you know you know puts Myron Lizer in the, in that category. It's like so all of those things that we we seem to you know rail against, including things like mining and extractive industries that the Navajo Nation is uh, is still committed to. It, it just, I mean, so I guess my question to you is. Do you have, for one thing, tell me you, you, you have a, uh, what your view is on this stuff and kind of where the, you think the Navajo people fall on some of this stuff. Absolutely. Well, I myself uh, am not going to pretend in any way or, or shape that I'm a, an appropriate voice for the people of the Navajo Nation. Sure. Um, but I can definitely speak to um, what my contemporaries and the, the movement leaders that I work with all have shared in terms of the list of leaders that you, you <laughs> that you brought to mind as you're talking about this pattern we're, we face um, with this disconnect between uh, the, the elected leadership of our tribe, particularly our president and office of president and vice president and what our grassroots communities really want. And I think it, it's an important way to frame the question because I was ready to jump in and just rail against Lizer. And, and I did listen to his remarks. He did already speak at the RNC um, and I wanted to see what, what he, what he touted, but I'll get into that later. Okay. Um, because he really did set a good foundation for understanding how endemic this and problematic this issue is. 
Um, you know, it's no it's no uh, accident that we've had several leaders that been highlighted and and um, you know projected on the national stage that have had very problematic politics. And I think that it ha it demonstrates a lot about the interconnection between colonization, between mainstream religion, and between mainstream politics. And how uh, political ideologies and polarization plays out in in crafting, you know, this national narrative that serves empire, specifically settler colonial empire, and and the agendas that the leaders of those systems and the power holders of those that that profit off of those systems hold for the entire country, but most especially for Indian country. And so, like when when I was thinking about you know Ben Shelley and his support with uh, Snyder and uh, what you said about um, when, when we're kind of talking about how to how to frame this um, Peter McDonald and his embezzlement, who's also uh, was brought in to be a voice for the during the Redskins um, the height of the Redskins debate. You know he he attended a game um, as a coat talker, yeah. Yeah, as a co-talker, uh, and you, and and it, and it's this intersection of of um, religion, religious doctrine, um, uh, of of nationalism, um, and allegiance to the U.S. military, uh, and and a political ideology that has very much been forced upon our people through generations of boarding school violence and indoctrination. Well, and, and, so and it we, creates almost a a syph sycophantic relationship in many ways, and and. And it doesn't, you know, it, it isn't just with the Republicans. We see the same thing with Democrats. I mean, as yes. I as I yes. watched, um, uh, what's his name there, uh, uh, Archambault um, up oh. in Standing Rock, <laughs> sucking up to uh, up to Obama, even as the Obama administration mm -hmm. was the one who was laying the foundation and the approvals and and the build out of uh, uh, of of the Dakota Access Pipeline. We so we see Absolutely. it with both parties, but. It just seems Absolutely. even more pronounced as uh, as we've seen. He heard so much of the racist commentary coming out of uh, guys like Donald Trump and many on the right. Um, and just to have, you know, again, a Navajo for Trump movement. I mean, is, you know, and look, I understand that. I would, not, I would not call it a movement. <laughs> I would not call it a movement. All right. Okay? They are <laughs> a small misformed, misinformed and misled minority. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I would not give them the honor of calling them a movement, but you're absolutely right. And that's why I was very careful with how I was explaining this is that I don't, I, I definitely do not play into the two party politics and thinking one's much better than the other. And I'm so sick of the narrative that we have to like, as our, our own agency uh, in participating in this political system is to pick the lesser evil over and over again, to no progress or no radical transformation of the actual lived realities of our people on the ground. And so that's what makes this especially egregious is that well, because the, of these reasons. Yeah. Well, and the, the very idea that if we select ourselves as opposed to their two, one of their two parties, if we select our own advancement as distinct people, that somehow we're giving we're giving up or something. I mean, it's 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 insane to me that when we advocate our own uh, distinction, our own sovereignty, if you will, and that's a word that's mm -hmm. a little bit problematic. But uh, but if we if we advocate our own distinction, our free and independent existence, that somehow we're delusional, and that and that we have to subscribe to their two party system. We have to choose which is the lesser of two evils, even though both parties. And you can go back historically from the you know to the beginning of their system, they they have all been a part of the genocide and the the the, the oppression against against native people. Absolutely, absolutely, and it's one of the the, the most. Uh, devastating and dehabilitating illusions that our people have been conditioned under. And it's not just our people, right? It's like the American general public at large. Like, this is your alternative. The only difference is that as indigenous peoples, we can seek an alternative form of governance and build alternative strategies for how we assert and exercise self-determination. But it's that particular politics, that body of politics that allows for those types of movements for self-determination, for, for exercising our right to restore and reclaim our traditional territories that have been illegally seized by the federal government, 
um, that 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 uh, co-ops those movements or that reframes those movements in a way that makes it seem like that is too idealistic, naive, or are are unrealistic in <laughs> in a sense. And when when that's what we should be doing, those are the type of leaders we need representing us. But I feel like there's entrenched barriers within tribal politics because of the nature of how our tribal governance systems have been quote unquote legitimized and 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 structured under this paternalistic over overview of the federal government that make that inherently possible just the same way that the Democratic Party operates to placate our our co-op are to push back against far leftist movements in order to maintain the status quo. But it, it, it's a part of how the, these systems have been structured from the beginning, and it's part of their evil ingeniousness. But it's also what makes it so important for us to align together as peoples who are tired of systems of oppression, who are tired of these generations and legacies of violence, the militarization of our police, the, the killing uh, of black and brown relatives, the disappearing of our, our women, our trans relatives all across children. the board and uh, our children yes and 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 all across the board this this inequality that continues to be further embedded into our economies and into our com communities we like it is unacceptable that our vice president and our president have participated in the charade of politics right right and you know and and again there this idea that 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 if we reclaim and assert our identity as distinct people as opposed to adopt the assimilationist pol policies that we are somehow you know delusional i mean and that's and, it, and, it, and i hate to frame it exactly that way but that's i mean when i when i hear some of the the more yeah, some of the most iconic native voices telling us to go out and vote in their in their system. You know, another place, and, and I'm sorry, and please somebody correct me if if I am wrong in this, but even even the census issue, the U.S. Census is for determining appropriation of um, of representations uh, in Congress, uh, in in the House of Representatives, and for. Um, apportionment of dollars flowing into, mm -hmm. into states. I don't know in any circumstance where uh, where the census determines the dollars that go to a native territory, perhaps to a state, it may, uh, just like congressional representation. To oh, a they're, state. they're smart. They're smart. They, they do find ways to use it. And the allocation are, are the allotment of federal programs um, that are meant for community improvement, like critical community infrastructure, for example. If you were to put a proposal together to apply for state, federal funds, or even tri tribal governance funds, one of the requirements is to use the census count to determine what the population density is in your communities. And so this is why over and over, rural communities find a real really hard time tapping into and accessing uh, these, these pots of money that are supposedly there to help improve, improve community infrastructure for everyone because of the, the disproportionate um, information found in the census through undercounting and, and what's the actual lived reality of the community. Well, the, but uh, the, problem, example, the problem with, with counting, though, on the census is that there is no – when you check that box, Native American – there's no accuracy to it, and I know. and and we are never going to represent a significant population density that was that was designed out of our population already. And if they wanted to know what the numbers were of our, of the people living on a given territory, they could get that from leadership if they wanted to. I mean, the idea that they yeah. that they do it in this way and they you know and and it becomes this invasive kind of procedure that might be fine for Americans, but if if we're we aren't necessarily all subscribing to that notion um and and then we get then we get called out about it out it, like like we're somehow violating our own people uh for not participating it's 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 a you're right it's a, it's yeah. a sneaky kind of you know creepy way of, of getting us to comply <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is how it, how um, pervasive this indoctrination and conditioning is that that this system is the only way uh, and through the system and the mechanisms that it provides and that it creates is the only way to legitimately enact change or advocate for whatever resources it is that your community or your family needs. And, and it's sickening. Well, in most of those 
you know, most of the um, the responsibility that the United States has towards Native people should never have been confined to census data because most of it is it has to do with payments that we are owed, not some yes. arbitrary <laughs> acts of charity or or social welfare or anything else. They've reduced it to that, but that's another one of those crafty things that that has been done to us. And and again. You know, so we get into playing the, these these sycophantic roles to whatever you know, wherever the power happens to lie, whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats, and you know, and 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 we ignore the fact. I mean, look, even even with this upcoming election, look, I it, it's great that folks like Deborah Hallen and Sharice David and, and and others have advanced their individual political careers, but let's be clear here. They get they get elected by white people predominantly. I mean, they they aren't going. The native vote isn't what get, what gets those people in. So their obligation, while I appreciate they may um, raise native issues, their first and foremost uh, obligation to the constituency is to the white people, to the folks that that elected them, and um, and to the regions that they represent, which aren't oftentimes. They they aren't necessarily native territories that they represent, and if they are, it's only very specific native territories they represent. So so when I hear the parades that people want to uh, want to throw, I look at some of these folks and I'm thinking, oh, we lost another one. We lost another native leader to the to the ruling class. And I, I said the same thing when people were praising Diane Humatiwa for for getting her first uh, you know position uh, under, under Obama as a federal judge. She was advanced by two Republicans, and mm. and frankly, her mm -hmm. rulings have not exactly gone the way uh, she hasn't ruled in favor of any native positions. In fact, the first ruling I think she had was a highway case that she ruled against the native people who were saying yeah. this was going to desecrate our land. So. I, you know, our, our people just don't understand what the system is built for. And even if we participate in it, it's not a system built for us. Yeah, not for our not for our vision, our end goals of liberation and land rights and land back and treaty rights. Uh, absolutely. They, they could not. They could not. stand. The system could not work towards that because it would it inherently contradicts and conflicts with its ultimate objective, which is to monopolize and privatize every resource and every piece of land that has any value in this country. Well, and if you listen to you know to the words of either Justin Trudeau or Barack Obama on the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, they basically paralleled each other's comments. They said that they um, uh, support or endorse the aspirations of the agreement, provided it doesn't conflict with their <laughs> laws. Well. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what your laws do. They do conflict with many of the articles of the UN Declaration. And the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People is not a very solid document in terms of really respecting our distinction. The, the only, the time, the only word, time the word sovereignty enters into the equation is when they're talking about the sovereignty of the states and that nothing in the document is, uh, is intended to violate their sovereignty. Forget about us. I mean, there, there's nothing about statehood or, or, or being rep really recognized as a, uh, as a distinct nation. They, it's, it's, it's a tap dance around what, you know, and frankly, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples says clearly that it is the minimum standard for for for, uh, for well being for you know for the survival and well being of Native mm -hmm. people the minimum standard, and yep. and yet you couldn't get even Barack Obama or Justin Trudeau to to go out far enough on a ledge to say, you know, we um, uh, we fully endorse this, and in fact we uh, we will pursue more than the minimum standard. No, they 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 won't even endorse the minimum standard. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think that that's what makes um, Myron Leiser's comments at the RNC that much more infuriating, you know, like the the subtext in there of kind of like the, the First Nations or the first people of this nation um, have have leaders that have always sought to lead our nations and people to a better life. But we haven't been as successful as the rest of America. Uh, just just like that's how he started his speech. Oh, and it just I didn't hear it. So I'm hearing out. it from you, I guess. So <laughs> it grossed me out because I was just thinking like that in itself represents the type of indoctrination that facilitates the erasure of the systemic issues, the colonial oppression, the legacy of settler colonial 
colonialism and the, the impacts that it's had on our people that led to us to be particularly vulnerable to this health pandemic that has taken so many of our precious relatives, our knowledge holders, our language speakers. And he had the audacity to just thank President, Snez, our, President Trump's handling of the pandemic saying that because of the assistance and the, fi the the largest financial package ever ever given to Indian country, that we were able to pl make, um, use that assistance to hit a plateau um, despite the health disparities. Previous administrations failed to improve when this is a president that has, like, has been championing and trying to promote the reopening of uranium mining in our communities, which is directly linked to the pre-existing health conditions that took made so many of our populations vulnerable. When they, like, when this is the administration that allowed for the for the delays and critical PPE ventilators and health 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 funds and resources that could have saved lives in the beginning of this pandemic, lives that were lost unnecessarily because of the inaction and the 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 ideology of this uh, political party that's in power. That and this the, the, was the, not the, something that the denial, that was, the denial, yeah, that, the denial. Know, I mean, it's it, you're right. It's it's absolutely uh, you know absurd. You know, the other thing you you, you mentioned what Lizer's comments where it's 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 as if we can't say the words that we are the first people of this land instead we've got to say we're the first people of this nation that's not true mm -hmm. we weren't a part of this nation and in fact mm -hmm. many of us refused we to acknowledge yeah i mean and <laughs> you know and even even the the people who will sub subscribe to the notion that the united states had the legal right to declare us citizens in 1924 that's 19 freaking 24 it's not even you know it, it's nowhere near I mean, we weren't the first peoples of this nation. It was white people who were the first peoples of this nation. I mean, that's what, yeah. it's their nation. That's And that's what they claim. They've always claimed. That's why they say things like, make America great again. They want to return mm -hmm. to this idea of white supremacy. And that's what's being advocated, not just by Donald Trump, and, and not just by Republicans. We we actually, th there are hints and shadows, if not direct um, language that that we hear out of uh, you know look i remember when obama was doing some speech i think to the to ncai or something like that where he had made some comments about us you know that he was going to work hard to make sure that we could pursue the american dream really mm -hmm. you think that's mm -hmm. what our intent is to pursue some fabricated yeah. you know uh, fantasy about what every american wants i mean this i mean and this gets into that same narrative Absolutely. And you heard that at both the DNC and the RNC. In fact, like Liza, it, it like said those words exactly that before this president, we've never been invited into the American dream. And I feel like we need to like counter that as much as possible because the American dream is manifest destiny. Absolutely. Of course, we were never invited into that. It was predicated and built off of the vision of enslaving our black relatives and stealing our, our outright, just completely eliminating all of the indigenous nations oh come on now we were we were a party to manifest Dest destiny we just happened to be the party that was be having you know massacres waged against them <laughs> no it's no when i hear this it stuff it's terrible. like how can you deny history so blatantly you know and 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 man we that's why i wanted to have you on the show i wanted your voice to at least offer a retort or, you know, so so anybody doesn't think that that this that there's, you know, somehow, you know, the contamination of Navajo water has has, you know, destroyed all Navajo, <laughs> all Navajo thinking, because I know I, I know some, you know, most of the people that I know from Navajo territory, I I, look, I feel you know kinship too, but then I hear this stuff out of out of what invariably ends up being the leadership. And you talked about this, but. I want to go even farther than this. There, there is a, there's a, a manipulation that goes on with, you know, with, with so-called recognized leadership on native territories. Not only do we see example after example of, uh, you know, very little support coming from the grassroots people for these elected governments. I mean, I had a guest on last week talk about um, uh, in Six Nations in Ontario, only 4% of the population 
participate in their band council elections in uh, on in, in, in Six Nations. I mean, it's so it gives you an idea that the and these are considered the 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 recognized leaders. And and I don't know what the percentage of population th that participates in Navajo elections. But as I've looked at, you know, various territories that have these elections, for one thing, that system of, of choosing leadership is something that is not it's not who we are. I mean, some of us, you know, Haudenosaunee, we, we have a specific wampum belt that, that tells us not to participate. It's called the two-row wampum. It says that we are not to, uh, to enter into their vessel and participate in their systems. So, and I, and I suspect that many cultures had some of those same types of warnings or prohibitions, and that's why these governments exist almost in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And we've had we have historically always had low voter turnout as well. Um, and I'm not sure I used to know what the um, the voter turnout was for the Nas Lizer administration. Um, but it, I, I don't think it was historic in, in, by any means of the word. Yeah. Um, and this is because both both because um, the the way that we elect our, our presidents is is very different. Right. We don't have two party systems. Um, we have this, a lot of the same systemic barriers that it comes to voter participation that impacts any low income, poor or rural communities. And so there, there's just a lot of and there's also like little little benefit to voters to participate in these elections because we're always getting like candidates, not even leaders. But our choices for candidacy or for leadership are, are not inspiring, to say the least. You well, know? And, and, then, like, and then the role the churches play in especially in rural communities. Communities and, and them Absolutely. being among the uh, the largest outreach programs that exist in in these de these territories can also skew you know not only the, who the leadership is but who the who the voters are that, that participate. So there's got to be a lot of that. Hey, Janine, we're at the bottom oh, of the hour. Yes. Let me let me take a, a just a break here, and we'll we'll be right back, and uh, and we'll kind of wrap this up. I want to I I want to get some some of your final thoughts on you know just just. What is what's in the immediate future and and maybe hash a little bit more of this out. But let me uh, let's just uh, take a brief break and we'll be right back. This is John Kane with Janine Yazi. All right. Thanks for coming back. This is John Kane uh, with Let's Talk Native. I've got Janine Yazi joining me for the program. We are we're, look, we're, on one hand, the attempt was to try to make sense for what is being represented by the, the Navajo leadership where even though I thought that was going to be very, very difficult to do that. So it was rather than trying to make sense for what the position that the this vice president, Myron Lizer, was uh, you know, his words that he was saying at the RNC or even some of the things that comes out of their their president, uh, you know, Jonathan Nez, there's. I, it, you know, it's almost indefensible from a native activist standpoint. I, I suppose for the the truly indoctrinated, um, maybe some of this stuff flows fine. But uh, but for for the rest of us who are out there trying to champion issues that are directly related to oppression, that are directly related to um, you know to these oppressive policies of the states and of the federal government, and uh, you know what has become of the, you know th this whole cast. A capitalist system when we when we when we try to sort this thing out and then we have one of these voices comes out you know like like Lizer or or uh, nez um i just felt like at very least i wanted to get a, a navajo voice a dene voice that would uh, be able to offer something that made a little more sense or felt better to me anyway <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. And you, you know what makes me saddest out of all of this is how they do not understand. They also have a responsibility when speaking on the national stage to honor our other indigenous nations, our relatives who are at the front lines of dealing with a lot of the negative impacts and actions taken by this federal administration and by both parties. You know, everything from KXL, from the reduction of Bears Ears to Standing Rock and Dapple to uh, taking away the recognition of the Mashpee Wampanoag, the threats against the Arctic Wildlife Refuge, the, the attack against the sovereignty of the Cheyenne River Sioux tribe who dared to put up a blockade in order to protect their lands, the 
militarization of our police, the continued building of a boarding wall through sacred lands of our autumn relatives, mm -hmm. like the, the um, just like this, all of these things, the, the, the continued laying of federal charges against land rights defenders who dare stand up for protection of their sacred sites or treaty territories in order to protect their communities from COVID and from exercises of white supremacy and parades of white supremacy in their territories. Like, we have a responsibility as being one of the largest land, well, maybe we don't hold that distinction anymore with <laughs> a recent Supreme Court ruling, but as being one of, as one of the longest standing tribal governments and one of the one of the largest land based tribal nations with Navajos everywhere in urban spaces and in, intermarried into other communities, we have a responsibility to be conscious of all of those struggles and all of those battles and to speak with wisdom, love and compassion and not a, a, a fake political agenda that has no place in the realities of our people on the ground. We have we have that responsibility and we should have leaders that know how the gravity of that responsibility be the only ones representing us on the national stage. This is a disgrace. It's an embarrassment. And I am fully ashamed of our leaders even entertaining this as some sort of enlightened political strategy that's going to somehow benefit our nation no matter who wins. Now, is there... Will they be held accountable at all? Will there be any, you know, uh, any flashback from this? I mean, will, you know, how will the, these guys, uh, you know, be greeted? I, you know, I've seen some of the signs out there calling for the resignation of Nez and, and Lizer. Um But I don't think they're, they're brand new. I, I suspect they've been out there for a while. But, I mean, when they go out there and they're speaking as officials of the of the Navajo Nation, don't they have some obligation to represent the will of the Navajo people? I mean, do they can they just speak on their own behalf? Well, part of what's allowed them to operate under this like view of anim anonymity, our full exposure and accountability to the community is that our communities are very much disconnected from the national dialogue in general, mm -hmm. right? And so like, I, I don't think very many people listen to the DNC or the RNC unless they already ascribe to one or both of those parties or to this type of mainstream shenanigans and, and politics. And so the majority of our people aren't actually engaged in these conversations and so don't really know what our leaders are doing when they're out and about. And I think this is something that President, our Vice President Lizer has actually openly lamented in like interviews with local journalists, is that he's upset that not enough attention has been made locally about his appearances. Um, but you can definitely see that our, our engaged activists, our, our movement builders, our community grassroots uh, advocates who have been working for the human rights and the indigenous rights of our peoples for generations are very much holding them to account for how they're representing us and the disconnect that their words on the national stage have with our lived realities on the ground and our vision and goals for our, for liberation for our communities. Well, and I, I will say, for example, when Jonathan Nez was offering up Code Talkers as a new name for the Washington oh, football God. team, he almost immediately retracted that offer. And I suspect he must have had some immediate repercussions back home oh, yes. for doing such a, uh, a, an, a, a, an ignorant offer. Um, how? What was your sense for... Uh, for the immediate reaction when uh, when he had made such a bizarre offer it, it it was actually really empowering because it shows that um you know although previous leaders have been able to sort of float by with very little pushback in my experience since Ben Shelley and his support for for Israel and his trip out there which uh, a support that Jonathan Nez shares uh, himself uh, you see the emergence of a more critically engaged critical uh, critical um, critically intelligent and 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 sophisticated um, youth movement mm -hmm. that is leading the pushback against what these tribal governments are doing and they're 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 tenacious and they're tireless in their efforts to um hold these leaders to account you know the the signs that you're talking about i know a couple of the people who are behind those signs in in one location and they replace it almost on a weekly basis if not every few days because of people coming to take it down because they're not giving up i think that this is where the real political power of 
of our nation is going to be. And I don't mean in terms of like, you know, telling everyone to go vote or to run for office. I mean, the, the real grassroots political movement is going to be led by the next generation, as we're seeing in places all around the world in response to climate change, in response to um, the, the brutality uh, and, and the, the murders carried out by police, in response to the systemic oppression, and in response to, to pushing back against this narrative and this uh, this adoration of, of, of genocidal murderers and rapists that have come to be hailed as the founders of this country or as, 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 as figures to be celebrated um, through our indoctrination into this, this form of nationalism. And so, like, I, I have a lot of faith when, when uh, in, that, in that movement and in that generation of young intellectual, intellectuals, advocates, and activists who are taking their power back regardless of what these tr elected tribal leaders do. Now, is there, is there an alternative path um, established, or is this something that they need to assert and establish as a, as a means to, um, to assert you know, new leadership within uh, within uh, the Navajo Nation. I mean, obviously the existing elector electoral system, and I don't know if it's just two executives. If you if there's an elected council, and is there any checks and balances there? I mean, so I mean, is there is there an alternative for these young people who are tenacious, as you say, and who are stepping up for them to to uh, advance their not just their voice, but uh, but that power? Yes, absolutely. And I think the seeds of that have been um, planted uh, for the last gen last couple of generations um, from the matriarchs who held down the resistance on Black Mesa to all of the people who stood up against the development of new coal fired power plants and other uh, toxic industries coming into our territories. Those are our elders now who are still still, uh, you know, very much active and f continuing in the good fight, but are also also shifting to more of a role of being a mentor and a guide to a lot of the younger um, minds that are coming forward to lend their energy and their power to this movement for liberation. And I think we're seeing a really good mix of, of, of people coming together in a good way, understanding that in order to have a successful political movement, we have to reroute ourselves in our cultural values, especially in our kinship ties, and reimagine not only uh, what leadership structures look like, but what movement builds looks like in our communities and I this is all happening you know like in, in our community meetings and our our mutual aid efforts and uh, the ways that we're continuing to fight for systemic changes in our communities for food sovereignty water sovereignty for environmental justice and I think that you know this this it, the 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 issues that have arose from this global pandemic have actually created, in, in a way, some of the conditions that we need in order to rebuild an, uh, an entirely new system. And I, I have no doubt that the the community organizers and the advocates on the ground that have dedicated their entire lives to this, see the power in our new young leaders that are emerging and that something beautiful is going to happen uh, within the next year um, to, to really build off of this effort. Well, in, you know, my generation and, and those you know, a little older than me, uh, you know, were the ones who advanced things like AIM and the, the warrior society mm -hmm. movements and, you know, some of the, you know, uh, obviously occupation of Alcatraz to take over the BIA buildings and, you know, so many of the things that, are now being reflected upon, uh, you know, in the land back movement, in uh, in the blockade uh, movements that mm -hmm. have been, uh, you know, uh, erected to to stop pipelines or, you know, or you know, stand up against, you know, uh, well, you know, land creep and and that kind of thing. And of course, even you can hear the distinction in the way young people uh, and and, the, and frankly the people that I support um, approach things like Black Lives Matter. Uh, you, you know, you, if you ask somebody over a certain age, myself ex excluded from this, um, you know, the first thing you'll hear somebody say is like all lives matter or native lives matter. And and yet the younger people are saying, no, we don't need to appropriate that movement, that movement. We, we've been the bef beneficiaries of that movement. We've seen Columbus statues toppled. We've seen, you know, the Washington football team have to change its name because of, you know, because of, of money interest saying, look, this uh, this attention to racism that is being sparked by this, uh, not only the murder of George Floyd, but the, but the Black Lives Matter movement has far reaching effects. We don't need to water that down. And, you know, so we, we end up in, in these 
uh, you can see the generational shift and, and that it goes mm -hmm. from, with everything from the, the mascot issue to, you know, uh, you know, to younger people saying, you know, hell no, you know, we don't support the, this notion of advancing Christopher Columbus as our discoverer or, you know, or, mm -hmm. or, or any of that stuff. Yet the, some of the older guards, some of the people who are still running for these offices to, who are still, you know, playing, uh, you know, st standing in positions within their churches on our native territories, are are harboring all of that 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 same you know indoctrination uh, that you know isn't even entirely their fault because of residential schools and assimilation policies that mm -hmm. that are five hundred years old. But but regardless, their refusal to to yield, uh, and I would say that to yield to um, uh, the will of people who are saying no, we we deserve distinction, we deserve, um, and we have the right. And the um, the power to assert a free and independent existence. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I think that the the success of this and of this new movement that's arising is also that it's very much centered on healing and acknowledging both learning from the previous movements like the AIM movement and different occupations and standoffs that were led um, by those leaders and, and doing doing a really healthy, reflective, critical analysis of internal dynamics that helped um, weekend the, the power of those collective movements in order to learn from those lessons and reinstate in our, our modern movement building uh, better strategies, better protocols, and better mechanisms of accountability so that we're simultaneously addressing lateral and internalized oppression and violence while building a, a movement for solidarity that works for all of our indigenous peoples, because we're at a critical point, and this is the generation I think that that has this power of, of insight. We're at a critical point where we all need to get our act together in order to respond to the the issues created by climate change, in order to uh, put our the humanity back on a path that actually can have hopes for a future and can be active agents and building the world that future generations deserve to inherit. Well, and again, oppression in of itself is not enough to spark change. Until people who have been oppressed and who have experienced, um, you know, this, this level of oppression, I guess, see that there's an alternative, that there is hope, that there is an opportunity to change things. If you can't envision a, a better future, then you won't fight for it. The only way you can fight you can you can fight for a future is if you can envision a future that is more inviting than the one you're currently living in. And we can look, we can attribute almost every social ill that affects our people to uh, the the conditions that were created by U.S. policy. Uh, every you know every assimilation policy, the r removal, mm -hmm. rest, you know restriction of of land use. Um, contamination of our lands, of our rivers, uh, you know, pushing us into places that were, you know, that were unsustainable in terms of supporting a population, uh, removing our, our our social relationships by creating mm -hmm. individually recognized tribes as uh, as they've designated them, where they separate, you know, people who are normally related. Uh, you know, uh, uh, for example, I think about the the Oneidas. The Oneidas are the Oneida Indian Nation of New York, the Oneida tribe of Wisconsin and the Oneidas living in, uh, in, in Ontario. And, and so there, there's no connection here in, in Seneca territory. There's a Tonawanda band of Senecas and there's a Seneca nation. So there's these, all these separations that governments have, have played a role in, uh, in, in developing. And we see that, that, it, that it breaks down our social structures. So we do have people who are living um, in uh, living lives on native territories that are not very inviting, that 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 show no hope for the future or prospects for the future. So until we uh, build up our own confidence and, and and create opportunities for the future, even if they are very very tough because of where we are located and and some of the poverty that we're that we're saddled with, this is what what will affect change. We have to have a vision for the future. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> So I wanted to, you know, I, I, I guess you, you, you kind of went there. I mean, as far as, you know, seeing what, uh, what is on the, on the horizon in terms of the, the young people who are, are 
really poised, you know, to to affect change. Now, do you do you get a sense that um, that there? I mean, I, I've been asked this before, you know, about you know toppling existing um, uh, native native governing systems, you know, band councils, tribal councils, and and you know, and I've always taken the position that. The more responsibility we take up in a, in a grassroots movement, the more irrelevant we make them. It doesn't necessarily have to be the quote unquote revolution that mm -hmm. people uh, yeah. uh, you know, envision. So I, I, do you see people stepping up to make um, the elected councils less relevant or do you see something uh, more of, of a, uh, uh, more like a direct change in the governing system? I see more it people creating the governance systems we deserve, regardless of, of what happens with tribal government. Okay. Um, you know, I think that uh, a lot of cases, our understanding of how change needs to be enacted um, uh, in, in American politics, for example, American politics, for example, um, is very white supremacy based in terms like it has to be a conflict. It has, there has to be violence. There has to be like this mounted tension and, and whatnot. And I think what we're learning um, and, and the, the, the circles that I've been privileged to be in and just seeing the wonderful work of community organizers led by elders uh, is that it's, it's much more important to create and to heal and to, to always also um, be aware of and build that discipline for our warrior sides to, to fight the, all of these constant attacks against our communities, our lands, our resources, our sacred sites. Um, but that to, we also need to invest uh, maybe twice as much even uh, into the creation of, of, of something new. And, and I think that there's a lot to, to that's being learned in, in this new way of movement building across indigenous communities in the so-called developed nations. Um, and there's a lot of solidarity being built using, uh, you know, like digital communications and other uh, ways that we've been able to create spaces together as indigenous peoples to share that knowledge and those strategies um, uh, that, that have been emerging um, in, in recent recent times. We got to fight for something, not just against something. So I, I, I hear you. And uh, Janine Yazi, I want to thank you again for joining me. I look forward to having you back. Um, we'll uh, look when you have something that you definitely feel like um, you need to you know, put a voice to. Uh, don't hesitate to call. I, I, I'd enjoy having you back, not just to talk about um, d disturbing, <laughs> disturbing news, but perhaps some good news. I mean, it would be nice. So, um, please do, uh, do join me again. I would look forward to that very much. Absolutely. I, I look forward to it as well. All right. Thank you very much. Hey, if, um, if you are not subscribed to our podcast or to our YouTube channel, you, um, you may be missing some content. Uh, we not only do Let's Talk Native, but we also include in our podcast the show that I do in New York, which is Let's Talk with, uh, with Regan DeLoggins and John Kane. Um, on our YouTube channel, we also include uh, the shows in New York and the, uh, and the shows here, but we also include short form videos. So uh, please do consider subscribing to our podcast and you can, you can find them just by searching Let's Talk Native with John Kane podcast. Um, on the YouTube channel, you just have to look for Let's Talk Native TV. Uh, encourage you to do, that, to do about that. I also want to direct you to our website where you can find a link to our, our Patreon site. Um, again, what's, what's it? It's, it's Patreon patreon.com slash let's talk native so uh uh please do consider uh becoming a contributor to our um uh, to our, our our patreon page um it uh, it enables us to do more of what we do here i do want to give a, a shout out to my to my sponsors uh ross and holly john and the rje family of businesses eric white and erw enterprises and the good folks at grand river enterprises thank you so much and thank you for listening yahweh